<laughs> so I am um, Rochelle Ferris. I'm one of the senior judges. And um, our kind of our format for today is we're going to introduce everyone. And then um, I'll read a little, little um, intro and then we'll get started. So Christine, do you want to start by introducing yourself? For the sure. seventh Hello. time today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Christine Machado. I've been um, judging for the past seven years. This is my first year as a senior judge. Um, I've been um, in the corporate world, in banking and operations, um, consulting and compliance. And I'm happy to be here today and uh, give you some feedback. Nola? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nola Wanta. I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy for the College of Business Administration. I lead a number of initiatives um, with our dean and have been in business management education for 18 years, so working with executives and MBAs for a very long time. So welcome, everyone. All right. And Brian? Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm Brian. Um, my background is in uh, sales. Um, I worked in Silicon Valley for a lot of years and now I run a sustainable food company uh, of all things. So um, done this competition a couple of times before as a judge. I uh, participated in something similar as a student way back when and I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys have to present today. Thank you. Liam? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Liam. Competed in this when I was an undergrad. This is my first year as a judge. I work in the finance industry for a asset management company here in LA, and I'm excited to uh, see the presentation. Okay. No. Hi, everybody. I am a corporate controller for a construction firm in Seattle, and uh, really looking forward to hearing your presentation. <laughs> Hi. I'm Rochelle Ferris. You'll hear my voice a little bit throughout this. And I just want you to know I missed complete, we completely missed the whole eclipse. So um, I retired from technology a few years ago. I managed major implementations for large companies like SAP, Oracle, and UKG. And I am currently enjoying a career as a chaplain in a hospital. So with that, we will get started with this presentation. Oh, and um, Christine, you'll do the timer? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, let's go. I'll start you guys when you have your presentation up and start talking. Can everyone see this? Yes, we can see it. Um, so thank you to the European Union for inviting us today to talk about e-waste and plant obsolescence regulatory challenges and opportunities in the European Union. We are LCDS Consulting. I'm Emma. I'm Ethan. I'm Mikey. And I'm Leighton. So did, did you know that 347 million metric tons of unrecycled e-waste with less than one quarter, approximately 22.3% of the year's electronic waste mass was documented as properly collected and recycled? And according to the European Union, planned obsolescence is responsible for nearly 47.8 million tons of electronic waste. And so the agenda is that this alarming statistics on e-waste and planned obsolescence is a reminder of the urgent need for action. It's these pressing issues that bring us together today to explore, understand, and discuss potential solutions in our agenda. 
So for our agenda, we would talk about the background and problem, the relevant stakeholders, the existing regulations, and our brief solution overview, ethical, financial, and legal standpoints, our solution, timeline, risks, and mitigations, and finally, our conclusion. And now I'll pass it to Ethan to talk more about the background and our problem. Thank you, Emma. So WEEE, also known as waste from electrical and electronic equipment, is a growing uh, global issue with the European Union generating around 12.3 million tons of e-waste per year, which accounts for approximately 20% of the global e-waste. Um, the rapid advancement of technology and consumerism has led to a significant increase um, in e-waste, which contains toxic materials like lead, mercury, and cadmium. So these materials can pose a threat to human health and the environment uh, by con contaminating soil, water, and air. Um, current waste management practices are also not sustainable, and e-waste contains valuable materials like gold, copper, and palladium um, that can be recycled and reused. Um, the informal recycling sector, which is common in developing countries, often use dangerous and inefficient practices leading to environmental and health hazards. Um, moreover, um, many ele electronic devices are designed with short lifespans or components prone to premature failure, um, leading to like a culture of planned obsolescence. Uh, this not only contributes to the e-waste problem, but also leads to resource depletion, uh, increased carbon emissions, and higher costs for consumers. Um, to address the WEEE problem, uh, it is essential to promote sustainable design provide incentives for recycling and enact regulations to curb planned obsolescence. So planned and indirect obsolescence are two practices that contribute to the growing problem of e-waste. Um, planned obsolescence is the design of a product to have a shorter life, sometimes by limiting its functionality to a certain number of operations, uh, which can lead to consumers purchasing new products more frequently, contributing uh, contributing to the e-waste problem. Um, indirect obsolescence, on the other hand, occurs when spare parts uh, required to uh, repair a product are unobtainable or when the product cannot be repaired. So this can also lead to consumers purchasing new products instead of uh, repairing the old ones, contributing to the e-waste problem. Um, both of these practices have negative impacts on the environment and can also be costly for consumers. Um, so it's important to promote sustainable uh, design and recycling practices, uh, as well as encourage the right to repair to address these issues. Um, by working together, policymakers, industry stakeholders, and consumers can help reduce e-waste and promote a more sustainable future. Now, Emma, uh, we'll go over the relevant stakeholders. So for the relevant stakeholders, um, it's the European Union, the the manufacturers, the consumers, and the environment. For, for the EU, it's the EU policymakers that play a crucial role in enacting and enforcing regulations to curb planned obsolescence among its 27 member states. And this includes strengthening existing legislation and introducing new measures specifically targeting planned obsolescence. Electronic ma manufacturers play a central role in addressing planned obsolescence. They must prioritize sustainable design practices including designing products for longevity, repairability, and recyclability, embracing modular designs that, that allow for easy component replacement that upgrades can extend product lifespan and reduce e-waste. Manufacturers should also be transparent about the production processes. And for the consumers, the consumers have the power to influence manufacturers' practices through purchasing decisions. However, they often lack information about the product's repairability and environmental impact. And by providing consumers with more transparency regarding product lifespan and repairability can empower them to make more sustainable choices. And for the environment, the improper disposal of e-waste can have a severe environmental impact. E-waste in landfills contaminate soil and groundwater, posing risks to food supply systems and water source. And now I'll turn to Aiki to talk about the existing regulations by the EU. Um, so thank you for that, Emma. So this is just like a general timeline of like the current existing regulations. So in June of 2000, the European Commission proposed updates to the WEEE directive, 
And this was more of a strategic move to better handle the increasing issue within e-waste, which is prompted by a fast-paced growth within electronics consumption and also technological turnover. And the main goal of this was to enhance the collection, treatment, and recycling efforts across the European Union. And as of, you know, February of 2003, the WEE directive was implemented across the EU. And this directive is set for standardized e-waste management to be followed, which needs to have a more focused collection and treatment efforts from producers to consumers, which makes sure that there are responsible recycling and disposable practices. And moving forward to July of 2005, decree number 151 came into effect, which is likely specific to a member state, which is made to make sure that the national level application of the WEE directive is included, and it outlined the processes for e-waste management, which shows the importance of producer responsibility and financial strategies for waste treatment. And for February of 2014, the new WEE directive came out, which introduces a more stricter collection in, in regards of recycling targets, along with a more improved reporting measures. And this showed that EU's continued commitment commitment to tackling the increasing challenge uh, within e-waste. And responding to the increase of e-waste quantities, um, the EU changed its collection targets in 2019. And the new goals were either collecting specified tons of e-waste or achieving an 85% collection rate of the total e-waste that is generated. And in 2020, the WEE directive is crucial to the EU's more kind of general environmental strategy, which relates relates back to the initiatives like the Circular Economy Action Plan. And this plan, its main portion of the European Green Deal, which charts a course toward a more sustainable resource use. The directive shows this by promoting the recycling and reuse of electronics, which aligns with the EU's push for a climate neutral and resource efficient economy. It fosters a closed loop system where the lifespan of electronics is maximized, which reduces the environmental impact of e-waste. In addition, the Common Charger Directive also lowers on e-waste by standardizing charging devices across the EU. So this minimizes the production and disposable disposal of various chargers, and these direct directives illustrates the EU's overall and more general approach to sustainability, which combines the end-of-life management with waste prevention to facilitate the shift to a circular economy, which distinguishes growth from resource depletion. And lastly, in March of 2024, the Council included amendments to the WEE Directive and this was in response to the European Union Court of Justice rulings from 2022. And its goal is to maintain the directive's effectiveness and legal integrity. And now I will pass it on to Leighton, who will give an overall solution overview. All right, thank you, Aiki. So taking a look at our solution and a brief overview of it, our idea is to end up having producers take more responsibility for their actions, take more responsibility for the e-waste that they produce. And so our general solution is to tax companies based upon their product's life cycle um, and taxing them more for each step they take down this waste hierarchy as defined in the waste framework directive that the EU uh, has published. What this is trying to do is to try to disincentivize companies from simply creating more products that with a shorter lifespan and selling them to generate more revenue while at the same time being able to sell those products that have um, lower costs as they are lower quality in order to generate more profits. And this way we hope to help contain the e-waste problem and help to minimize the amount that manufacturers produce uh, in the long run. And now handing it, um, or now to continue talking uh, about our solution, we want to first introduce the idea of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal um, number 12, which is to ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. There are three primary goals for this SDG, the first of which is separating the idea of environmental degradation and economic growth. 
economic degradation, environmental degradation has always been linked to economic growth through the use of fossil fuels um, right now in our transportation industries, um, in um, our production and in manufacturing. However, we want to separate those things in order to create a sustainable uh, planet. In order to do that, one way you can do that is by implementing a circular economy. A circular economy can help take those physical, physical waste, such as e-waste, and help to recycle those products by reharvesting some of the raw materials from there. And instead of having those products end up in a landfill somewhere where they'll never be used again, we can instead recycle those products, reharvest some of the raw materials, and then re-enter that into the supply chain to have a circular economy. And that leads us to the third primary goal of the SDG, which is sustainable consumption and production. Not only do you want producers um, to create uh, sustainable products, we also want consumers to be able to consume them properly. So that means avoiding avoiding throwing away products when they have started to degrade a little, being able to repair products um, when and having those parts available to them to be repaired instead of simply throwing something out the moment it starts to get worse. And this ties back to e-waste um, in that idea of premature obsolescence, which ends up leading to greater profits, as mentioned earlier, where companies can create lesser um, lesser products that have that can generate them more revenue by selling more with lower with lower costs. However, these costs, um, the cost decreases, are not sort of appearing out of thin air. They're instead being moved onto the environment and moved onto the people who are living in those ecosystems that are being damaged by e-waste. And we hope to implement a solution that will take care of those issues. In addition to the idea of the UN, we also wanted to reiterate some of the European Union's own aims and values. One of your main domestic values is environmental protection. That is the protection of the current environment and also to improve the quality of the environment um, for future generations as well. In addition to your own domestic goals, you also have an international goal to contribute to the global, uh, to global sustainable development of the economy. And what that means is similar to what the SDG is in uh, talking about, which is the creation of a circular economy, the creation of an economy where products are not simply going in one linear flow from manufacturer to consumer and then into a landfill. Instead, after it's done use, being done used by the consumer, it is instead repurposed, um, reprocessed, and put back into the hands of the manufacturer for them to create more products with those old products. And you already have your own history with e-waste. As mentioned earlier by Ike in the timeline, in 2020, you implemented the Circular Economy Action Plan to help mitigate some of these issues in regards to e-waste and also other waste. In general, the idea is to make sustainable products a norm in the EU, to ensure less waste, and to make circularity work for uh, people, uh, regions, and cities. And in doing so, your idea is to create more sustainable products um, and to decrease the amount of waste and to make uh, make sure that consumer uh, producers are held responsible for their actions um, and to help disrupt the industry in a way that will push them towards more green um, methods of producing. And one way that you've already done that is through the Common Charger Directive in 2020, where you decreed that um, where you decreed that phones, computers in the future, starting from the end of 2024, will all need to use at least incorporate the same type of charging cable, that being a USB-C, in order to minimize the amount of waste that comes from the buying and uh, buying and throwing away of different cables as they come and go. Um, as USB-A comes and goes, micro USB, um, Apple's Lightning cables, as they all come and go, um, they generate a lot of waste every year. And you hope to contain that. And it was a success as in your own report, you estimated that that would save about 50 kilotons of e-waste each year in the EU alone. However, that is just one step towards fighting the greater problem of e-waste, and we feel that there is more to be done in that regard. And so we want to move on to our ethical, financial, and legal uh, analysis in order to better understand the situation and to come up with a solution for this issue. Taking a look from the ethical standpoint, uh, we first want to assess the environmental damage that is being done by the, uh, by the problem of e-waste. 13.5 megatons of e-waste, that is 13.5 million tons of e-waste is being produced every year by the citizens of the European Union. And as mentioned by Ethan earlier, there are severe adverse effects in ecosystems. Uh, and even worse, not just is, not only are you producing more waste, you're also offloading that waste to many other foreign countries who currently may not be able to deal with all the e-waste, do not have the requisite um, recycling 
um, plants uh, and procedures to take care of that waste safely in a manner that doesn't affect the environment. And this current state of affairs is in non-compliance with SDG values. This non-circular flow of materials is, is going against both um, the SDGs idea of creating a circular economy and also your own uh, circular economy action plan, where these manufacturers are inclined towards unsustainable means. Furthermore, this current state of affairs is also in compliance with your own values. Um, it's poisoning ecosystems and communities. And furthermore, you're also dumping e-waste to foreign landfills um, to create more problems, not just for your own union, but also for other countries. And so our solution requirements are to disincentivize premature obsolescence in manufacturers and also to force companies to create more sustainable products, um, whether that be through reducing plant premature obsolescence or by creating right to repair or by having them create more recyclable, more reusable, longer lasting products. And now handing it off to Emma to talk about the financial and legal standpoints. So looking at the financial standpoint, manufacturers are responsible for the costs associated with collection, recycling, and safe disposal methods, which leads to increased operational expenses. And compliance with these environmental regulations, investment in sustainable design, and implementation of recycling pro programs all contribute to these increased costs. While these measures are necessary for the environmental protection, they can definitely impact the company's bottom line. And this financial burden may tempt manufacturers to resort to plant obsolescence as a means of mitigating operational costs. And by intentionally designing products with limited lifespan or using components prone to premature failure, they believe that they can reduce the financial strain associated with waste management. However, this short-sighted approach fails to address the long-term consequences of plant obsolescence, both for the environment and for the company itself. While it may offer temporary relief from immediate financial pressures, it ultimately perpetuates a cycle of waste and environmental degra degradation, and our solution aims to break this detrimental cycle. And looking at the legal standpoint, shockingly, there are no specific EU rules and policies explicitly addressing plant obsolescence. No specific EU rules mention plant obsolescence, but the subject ties in with the EU legislation on eco-design, waste management, use of natural resources, and consumer information. So for eco-design, the eco-design for sustainable products regulations aim to improve the circularity, energy performance, and other environmental sustainable aspects of products it sets eco-design requirements for specific product groups to significantly improve their circular circularity and, and energy. And for waste management, the Waste Framework Directive is the EU's legal framework for treating and managing waste in the EU. It introduces an order of preference to waste management called the Waste Hierarchy. And thirdly, for the use of natural resources, the EU has adopted measures for sustainable use of natural resources. And these measures aim to promote growth by transitioning to a modern, more resource efficient and competitive economy. And for the Consumer Rights Directive, the Consumer Rights Directive aligns with the national consumer where information needs to be given to necessary consumers before they purchase goods and services. And now I'll turn to Leighton to elaborate more on our proposed solution. And guys, just letting you know, um, we're just about to hit the five minutes. So I thought it'd be a good transition for me to tell you that. All right, thank you. Now moving on to talk about our solution, as Emma stated earlier, there are currently no uh, laws in place to explicitly address planned obsolescence. And we hope to change that by adding in this idea of extended producer responsibility. As mentioned earlier, we want to force companies to pay for the entire product life cycle uh, through taxes. And what that means is for each step down the waste hierarchy, we'll increase taxes on products. That means that if, if a product is ever recycled, uh, uh, a company will be taxed for that. And if it's disposed, they'll be taxed very heavily for that. And the idea of that is to incentivize companies to create their own recycling programs, create their own programs to help recover um, materials, and also to have companies work together with other third-party uh, recycling plants, perhaps to make their um, to make their products more recyclable. And also it incentivizes them to create these repair shops to make repair um, repair spare parts available to everyone in order to prevent the amount of tax that they incur. 
In addition, we also want to impose strict regulations against exporting waste to countries without a circular economy. Um, in order for countries to benefit, um, uh, countries currently benefit uh, monetarily from importing e-waste. However, it is damaging their own ecosystem. And as as the values of the EU is to look out for the international community, um, EU should only export waste, e-waste to company uh, to countries who already have that requisite processes in place to deal with waste. And now moving on to Ethan to talk about the potential risks and mitigations for our solutions. So one of the perceived risks in this is the cost burden on businesses, but these directives also provide opportunities for um, innovation and cost savings through sustainable design and recycling. Uh, public education campaigns and clear labeling can help increase consumer awareness of their role in e-waste reduction and recycling. Um, if informal e-waste recycling practices um, in developing countries can also be dangerous and inefficient. Uh, the EU can work with international partners for, to promote um, safe and sustainable e-waste recycling practices. Um, collaborations between policymakers, industry stakeholders, and consumers can help address the challenges of rapid technology advancements and enforcement in the global supply chain. So this is just a timeline of like the proposed solution. Um, and this is more separated by uh, every year. So in March of 2025, it is important to initiate this issue to the public awareness. And these are aimed at informing the public about the importance of uh, combating e-waste and ad adverse effects of plant obsolescence. And we believe that educating the consumer is the first step towards meaningful change. And moving forward, in March of 2026, it is crucial to introduce the legislation for e-waste. This law introduces incentives for the design and production of sustainable and durable products. It's not just about the regulation, but it's also about encouraging innovation and sustainability. And by March of 2027, analyzing to see the industry adapt to these new norms. So an e-waste management system was started supporting businesses in adopting circular economy models. And this is crucial as it's not only about complying with new laws, but also about the reaping benefits of resource efficiency. And moving forward in the year of 2028, um, expanding the efforts to the international stage, which promotes collaboration across various borders, and this global initiative aims to unify e-waste standards, which makes it easier for companies to adhere to best practices and for consumers to make informed decisions. And finally, in March 2029, it is important to analyze the impacts of the policies and also refine the strategy to make sure that it is on track to meet the long-term goal of zero e-waste. And this analysis is about learning and also preparing for the future challenges of sustainability. And to sum this all up, the five-year plan is a comprehensive roadmap to not just manage, but to also um, actively combat e-waste through awareness and legislation and also international cooperation. And with each of these steps, we're moving closer to a sustainable future where technology and environmental responsibility go, go hand in hand. And to wrap up our discussion, the WEE Directive is more than just a legislation. It's a vital tool in the EU's environmental arsenal, which is specifically designed to reduce the issue of electronic waste. It doesn't just manage e-waste, but it also empowers consumers with a right to repair, which mandates the manufacturers provide access to necessary information for repairing electronic parts. While the directive is a step forward for consumer rights and environmental protection, it does not come without its challenges mainly for the manufacturers. They're facing increased costs due to the need for a more sustainable production processes. And in addition to that, the right to repair could potentially conflict with business models that rely on frequent product turnover, which is a practice that while it is profitable, it raises serious legal and ethical questions. And to put this issue into perspective, um, the, EU's, the EU produces an produces around 11.6 million tons of electronic waste per year. And it is a clear indicator that our current consumption patterns are unsustainable. And the directives given solution is straightforward and also promote the reuse and repair of electronic products. And it's not just about recycling, but also extending the life cycle of products, which reduces waste and saving resources. This approach is not just a, is not isn't just eco friendly, but it's also economically sensible as well. And by promoting repair over replacement, we can conserve materials and energy, which stimulate local economies with repair services and encourage innovation 
in product design for durability. This concludes our presentations, and we welcome any questions or further discussion points you may have. Okay, good. You guys went over just a little bit, but that's the conclusion. Hey, Rochelle. Yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> um, I, as a, I'm not sure what my role is in the EU, but I do have a question um, just because I have a tiny bit of experience with with um, waste disposal in the EU. Um, could you could you confirm how much of this electronic waste is actually recycled? And if that was in your presentation, I'm sorry I missed it. Um, according to uh, the Global E-Waste Monitor um, 2020, um, only 17.4% of e-waste was recycled in 2019. Excellent. Okay, thank you. So I have a... Oh, go ahead, Nola. Go, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, so I just had a quick question about taxing and just to confirm. Um, you know, essentially what you're all looking to do is to tax the organizations or the companies, right? Not necessarily because um, you mentioned at some point that it's about taxing the product. So I guess I just wanted, you know, confirmation or clarification that it is the company that's being taxed and not the consumer at the tail end of it. Uh, yeah, it's the companies that are being taxed. So um, that stat of uh, statistic of 13.5 uh, million tons, that's the amount of e-waste that's being put on the market. And so mm -hmm. EU is already tracking the uh, amount of waste that, or the products that are being put on the market and how much e-waste that'll generate. Um, so we thought that it would incentivize companies. It would, it'd be a tax directly on the companies, right? For them to, mm -hmm. um, create, more, um, to create more products uh, that are recyclable or to implement processes that are recyclable. Um, we also, we, I think we briefly mentioned this as well, but, um, in the, in the European union, um, two thirds of, um, consumers would also, also mention that they were willing to pay more for products that were guaranteed to last for five years. And so this idea of like premature obsolescence is also something that consumers are, you know, concerned about and want to get rid of as well. Fantastic. And, um, I had one last final question, but it just slipped me. So I'll let one of the other judges ask the question, ask a question until it comes back to me. So. Well, my question was right in there with yours, Nola. And the, although the company is going to be taxed, I just foresee a recycle fee attached to every product that I purchase. Um, and. I'm just wondering what have you thought of that direct to consumer um, cost that might incur? Is there anything in your plan to prevent that from happening? Um, to clarify, when you're talking about the recycling fee, do you mean like um, like when you buy like a like a bottle of soda, they'll say like, oh, 10 extra, 10 extra cents for like yeah. a bottle of soda. Like just like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Tires. Mm -hmm. yeah. In in the European Union, in a lot of like uh, countries or not, con yeah, countries in the European Union, um, they already have a similar sort of program where like every bottle they buy, every can they buy is already being, uh, is, there's already like a, you know, a cost added to it, right? For recycling, there's a recycling fee. And then if the consumer themselves turns it in, they, that's up to them. They can reap that like 10 cents back, whatever. And it's already like common culture in a lot of the countries in the Euro European Union, um, Germany, France, uh, and whatnot. And so for the idea of e-waste, um, which I think is generally more long lasting, I guess. And also, um, a lot of consumers can see will have adverse effects, um, on the environment if it's just let out there, you know, to, to rot, like on the ground. Um, it's, I guess it's slightly different from, uh, from bottles and cans, um, where, you know, they have, there's different processes, I guess, for taking care of them and come, and I'm sure that consumers would be willing to pay more, but also, um, are willing to take on that extra recycling fee and then reap it back later when they turn it in. So it sounds like you're, it's okay if they pass it on to the consumer or that's going, it seems like we all think that's going to happen and that the consumer would be fine with it is what you're saying.
just try to reword what I think I heard. Yeah, but, I think okay. I heard the same thing, Christine, that at some point, I mean, Europe is a little bit different than us here in the States, but like, yeah, I, do you guys think that that will be the case down the line, like where the consumers are willing to pay an extra recycle fee? Because I think... can envision companies putting this tax back on consumers because mm -hmm. it's, we... it's hitting their bottom line. So, yeah, we think that we think that companies definitely will do that. But also, I think that the European Union themselves, um, they have uh, they have a lot of regulations, I guess, in place um, to take care of like passing um, cons I guess they, they think more about the consumers. They don't protect uh, companies as much as uh, the as the United States do. And generally, um, you know, oh, throughout the research, there was a general, there were like a few quotes from European Union members of parliament who were talking about this idea of um, extended producer responsibility and how they were, they were much, very much for it um, because of the amount of disruption it could do to the industry. Uh, they wanted to change the way that kind of producers manufacture things. Um, and like with the common charger directive, very often they have enough influence that they can force companies to change without having that much increase uh, in in prices, we feel. And Leighton, just to keep you on the spot, are there any, in, did, you, did you guys discuss any incentives to companies to build like repairable or, or longer lasting products from the government? Um, uh, I, I'm not sure if we specifically mentioned it, but uh, to you know to to create like longer lasting products. Um, first of all, we feel like having that like circular economy. I guess that idea of being able to recycle products, being able to recycle raw material. Uh, we feel like it's it it'll be a good thing for the uh, producers in the long run. They'll have to have um, additional, I guess, supply chains, additional ways to support themselves to be able to like diversify where a lot of their supplies come from, um, and they can be a slightly more self sufficient that way as well. Um, and we also, um, I guess in general, the, uh, the, hold on, give me a second to think about what I'm trying to say here. Um, sure. um and sorry, could you repeat the question again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just asking if, if, um, the thought, if rather than taxing, Employers, mm -hmm. if it like maybe offer um, employers, manufacturers, if right. you if guys thought about incentives, it's it's oh, yeah, well, okay. Um, we didn't particularly we didn't add it to our solution to um have any incentives, um, yeah. and that we did think about it, I guess, um, adding incentives to create right for right to repair whatever, but we, we wanted to, I guess, discuss the solution with manufacturers and have them think of uh, methods to create their own value through these industries, through having this recycling uh, industry, having this um, like spare parts industry, where they can also sell to third parties, their own parts, um, having their own repair shops um, and having that extra, I guess, stream of revenue for them as well. Yeah. And then I have one more question and I'm not sure who can answer this is how how would you how would you work this with overseas manufacturing like in other places that don't have strict management of e-waste so if it's manufactured somewhere else so would the burden still be on the european manufacturer um so you mean like products created and then imported in so imported yeah. into the us okay yes. Um, so whether or not the burden is on the manufacturer of the product in a foreign country to recycle their own products. Correct. Uh, okay. So the EU has, um, the EU passed a, a law recently, I believe in 2020, some, sometime in the 2020s, um, where they recently banned the import of waste of e-waste specifically into, uh, the European Union. And we feel like we could add that on, uh, sort of have a sort of connection to that in that for manufacturers to, you know, produce, they should produce domestically. Um, and we feel like you can import parts perhaps, but if the parts are being imported into here, it's the, it's the role of the manufacturer, perhaps the person like F Apple were producing parts in, um, 
um, somewhere in Asia and they were shipping them in. Those parts still need to be recyclable and they're still on the burden of Apple, who is still operating in the European Union for them to take care of those parts. I think the other judges, you guys can just unmute Brian and Liam because Brian, I know your hands have oh. been raised a bit. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw that too. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. I mean, just to, just to piggyback off that last question, um, I actually have another question, but um, I kind of want to keep this conversation going about the manufacturers because I imagine at the point of many, uh, at the point where these products are manufactured, there's probably a lot of waste on those at those sites as well. Do you have any information about how much the waste the manufacturers are producing, and if we're able to uh, recycle or um, or upcycle or, or you know responsibly take care of that waste as well? Um, and that's a little deep for maybe what you guys have gone here, but it is probably something worth considering because it could be it could be a I know a bit about manufacturing, so it could be a substantial amount of, of waste at that on site as well. So if you guys have any information about that or if that's something that you think would be worth looking That's definitely something worth looking into. Um I don't think we we found any sources, I guess, talking. Um, about specifically the waste at manufacturing plants, like when they're creating um, when they're creating parts assembling, uh, we didn't have any, uh, I guess, specific stats upon uh, e waste generation um, in like different industries and different like plants and that sort. But that that definitely is something to look into, and that definitely would help to you know make our solution a bit more detailed um, and a bit more targeted, well targeted towards manufacturers to kind of help them out uh, into transitioning towards more recyclable products. Um, while also still maintaining the goal of our uh, solution. Okay, thanks for that. Um, my other question was, uh, I have some experience in my area in the EU uh, with with um, sustainability and circularity around um, single-use plastics. And I do know that, uh, you know, when companies offers more sustainable solutions like biodegradable materials and compostable materials. Oftentimes, even though the brand and the manufacturer are doing the right thing and and, and providing products with better materials um, that are more ethically produced and um, made from more sustainable um, sources, there is still a large issue with what happens to that product when the consumer buys it and then goes to dispose of it. And oftentimes the collection points that are needed to properly dispose um, and you know um, you know take care of that product at its end of life just don't exist in a lot of areas. Do you feel like in the EU we currently have the network and the backend infrastructure with you know um, disposal sites, collection points, and uh, waste management facilities, so that consumers can actually do the right thing with these products. Because we can do, you know, we can go tax companies, we can make them be more sustainable. But at, at the end of the day, if we don't have the, the the collection points in place, if we don't have the right infrastructure on the back end to support this. It's all for naught. You know, it all ends up in landfill anyway. So, do we feel like we have uh, that network in place today? And if not, um, what would you recommend that we do to 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 get that uh, where it needs to be, so that we can actually capture a large portion of um, the sustainability that we're trying to capture here? Yeah, I think you. I think you bring up an excellent point. Um, I think definitely the the idea of like um, collection points um, is uh, you know could potentially be an issue, right? Because everything along the whole line, that idea of like circular economy, everything it needs to it needs to all come together. Everyone needs to work together in order for it to uh, truly work. Uh, and if there's one hole uh, in that process, then all the work you know uh, kind of goes away. Um, and I agree that right now there isn't this comprehensive um, network. 
um, to transfer e-waste to these uh, to to factories to be processed. Um, and there aren't even large numbers of factories really processing e-waste to the degree that would be necessary to take care of all the e-waste. This 13.5 megatons of e-waste that are being produced in the EU every year. Um, and we we did we did think of that um, in an, you know in the way that we. We wanted to have a buffer point similar to the common charger directive that the EU um, passed. We want to give a buffer point a few years, four years before we really implement this process and have companies slowly um, move on. And also, we wanted to we want we we kind of talked about this uh, idea of circular economy plan because um, this is already this is already a topic that's being discussed often in the EU and it's something that is being actively uh, worked upon. Um, most recently, in t- March 2024, they convened to talk about this issue. So we feel as if um, this idea of the circular economy that's already being implemented, uh, this idea of um, you know working out e-waste, we want to inf- incorporate a solution that is already in al- aligned with the goals of the EU, so that when they when they're creating more infrastructure, when they're thinking about creating more infrastructure, um, they can kind of combine these two plans and really help uh, have one help out the other. So having more recy- recycling more waste um, in general across the EU can also help. Uh, that kind of network of transportation can also help to recycle more e-waste as well. And if we have time, I, I have a question as well. Um, the The main focus of your solution certainly appears to be, you know, financial repercussions to companies, you know, additional taxes to kind of force them to manufacture more sustainably. Um, I was just wondering if I'm a company in the EU and this passes and I see all those financial repercussions, but decide to continue to manufacture with planned obsolescence and a ton of e-waste just because it's so profitable and just kind of eat the financial cost, um, would I face any legal repercussions in addition or would it just purely be I would owe the additional taxes. So currently um, in the EU, I guess they don't really have any laws against plant obsolescence and we're not planning to bring any against them. Um, you, the companies do have to find a way to deal with their, um, with their waste somehow um, because the EU has, um, the EU has strict laws against sort of uh, illegal transportation, I guess, of um, of e-waste outside of the country, uh, exporting it. And so all of it will be uh, collected and will be taxed upon them. Um, and I that that is a potential hole in the solution, um, but the EU convenes often and we feel that if they decide that, you know, whatever, whatever the number they decide on the taxing is not enough, they can add more. Or instead of having these sort of, um, these sort of financial uh, burdens towards a company, uh, like mentioned by the, uh, by the uh, other judges, we can you know, have more incentives for them instead. Um, maybe subsidize their production of a recycling plant, subsidize um, you know the creation of a more recyclable technology, or help them out some way um, to uh, create a more eco-friendly and more circular economy. And if I can add, the EU has already implemented um, various regulations and directives. Um, for example, like such as the WEE and um, the ROHS directives um, to address the e-waste problem um, and ensure compliance uh, with sustainable uh, manufacturing practices. Um, I think uh, companies that like fail to comply with these regulations may face like legal uh, action, including like fines, uh, sanctions, and even criminal charges. So um, therefore, um, it is like not only financially advantaged, uh, like advantageous um but also uh legally required for companies to adopt um sustainable uh, manufacturing practices um and reducing uh e-waste great thank you how about at the consumer level do we do we currently have uh fines or any sort of um Incentives, and I guess I'm thinking more fine from a fine perspective. What happens if and when uh, consumers don't do the right thing with with e-waste? And do we have do you have plans to uh, increase penalties there, or 
incentives brings people onto that? Um, I think that's something that we've not specifically talked about, but I think generally speaking, the um, having having something similar perhaps to like um, to the current idea of like plastic bottles, you pay ten cents more, you'll get ten cents back once you recycle it. Um, kind of that like hold like um, they I guess uh, yeah, so kind of like hold on your like you know a bit of your money, and then when you recycle it, you'll get that bit back uh, to kind of incentivize uh, people to recycle more. Um, maybe not that exact solution. Uh, perhaps something more complicated, but we feel something like that um, would incentivize consumers to recycle more. And that kind of idea of um, you know paying more for a bottle and recycling it more is works, especially in larger cities in, in the EU, um, where that kind of transportation network or those kinds of collection like bins are readily accessible, like you mentioned. Of course, that that is an issue that the EU needs to address to maybe make these more accessible to areas that are outside large cities um, and to make it accessible for, you know, in current areas where there is no of that existing infrastructure to collect uh, waste and e-waste. I, I like the idea if they're going to charge me, I like the idea of getting my money back. So I like that answer, Leighton. <laughs> um, just really quick, I think my question came back to me and it was around um, the circular economy. And I know that the EU is, um, you know, doing quite a bit in this particular space. I know that the Netherlands are definitely really doubling down on the circular economy in some capacity. Um, how do you perceive, you know, US-based companies embracing the circular economy or even, do they even have knowledge of it? I mean, I'm assuming that they're EU counterparts, right? Like, I mean, this is a whole systemic approach. And even you talk to anyone that you around what circular economy is, it is a very systemic, a system thinking systems approach, really, when you think about it, and even in, in your descriptions and, and you know, um, and all that. So I'm just trying to get a sense as consultants, your perspective from the U.S. perspective, how you know, how this notion of a circular economy is not a thing here, per se, unless my other judge colleagues will say otherwise. But, you know, what what are your thoughts on that, given a lot of these companies are US based? Um, yeah, that's, that's definitely an interesting observation. I think, um, I think most of us probably didn't hear about the circular economy before we really like looked into this idea, because it is something that, you know, definitely isn't really, I don't think, I don't think really talked about at all in, in the in the US. Um, but, uh, the goal of a circular economy, uh, is for the EU at least is, is meant to, you know, it's, it's like a stretch goal kind of for them to reach like, by like 2050. Um, so it is a slow process. Um, there's like, you can take step by step and we feel like, you know, this is like one step towards that, but in, in regards to like the US counterparts and whether they'll adapt, it feels like they, they probably will, especially if taken step by step. I feel like if the U European unit has said, Today we're gonna. If you don't have a circular economy, like you know, if you're, if you're, um, you know, if you're a company, if you're like supply chain, uh, you know, logistics, all that, it's not circular. Then you can't do business. I that wouldn't work. But I feel like over the course of time, as companies slowly adapt, as the EU makes like small changes towards that kind of goal, I feel like the United companies will slowly adapt just because the EU, EU is such a large market. Uh, not only just for revenue, but also of influence. It influences a large group of people, uh, large groups of countries, and companies very much want to stay in that uh, market and to stay competitive there. So we feel like um, if it's small changes, companies are definitely willing to make small sacrifices, especially if they feel as well that, it, well, it can it can also help the ecosystem out, it'll help the environment, and we also get to... Um, you know, maybe add more to a profile, have a recycling plant, and also able to um, get back more from our e-waste that is currently just being thrown away. We can get some, um, you know, material back, gold, uh, metal, you know, some alloys, things like that, things of that nature. They can recycle back and reuse. So there is benefit to the companies, but I think ultimately, just the allure of the market of the EU is 
is is a is a strong kind of negotiating power they can use. Oh, and also to add on to what Leighton said, I did a bit of research, and for U.S. based companies, I think the majority of the executives, around like ninety five percent, saw the transition to a circular economy as positive to their organization. And I think um I think circular economy is more on the EU side because I think America they use um ESG more often than the circular economy. Yeah, I mean it's a whole new term. The circular the whole notion of circular economy seems like it is it's very EU because the conversation around sustainability, I mean we're just having conversations around ESGs and really implementing that that for Liam our finance person here. You know, it's it's kind of a it's 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 not as embedded as sustainability has been in like the EU conversation since probably the early 2000s, right? So it's been an ongoing process and the next iteration is the circular economy, right? And so that in itself has very huge systemic implications, especially as we're considering, you know, partnerships, for instance, right? Like when you're doing this or when you discuss the stretch goals of partners that does the recycling, oftentimes they're in Africa or in in other countries. So what do they know what that is, right? So it's kind of like as, as we're talking about circular economy, I think the education piece is a big component of that. And I think something to be explored, but that was that was my question. Thank you. I can jump in with another question about uh, the 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 collection points and and like the um, the uh, waste management piece of it. Um, how much of the onus of around collection do you think relies um, or or lies with uh, private industry versus uh, us here at the government? Do we feel like we can? We should be, you know, putting money into creating government-run waste management facilities that we're, you know, financing through taxation, or are there ways that we can partner with uh, private industry and incentivize them? Uh, for instance, in the United States, I, I know I've seen like Target locations and different uh, chains, retail chains that have offered to collect bags and. Um, I think in some cases they might collect e-waste as well. Um, so my question is, how much how much should this be a a government you know back solution? How much can we um, rely on private industry to help us out? I think ideally it would be best for the private industry to be able to take charge of their of their own waste to sell it, set up their own recycling uh, plans to work together with them. I think that would be for the best. Um, however, if, well, I mean, in general, uh, it's, it's hard for, it's sometimes hard for uh, companies to sort of take charge um, for issues that don't directly affect their bottom line. And the environment isn't something that a lot of, um, isn't something that might directly affect the bottom line. So um, I guess, it is up to the EU's, I suppose, discretion to decide whether or not to go, you know, with private uh, to work with the private industry to, you know, have like third-party contractors or something like that, or subsidizing those industries, um, or simply setting up their own uh, their own waste collection and waste management industry. Um, though I think ideally, you probably want to first work with, you know, third parties um, and uh, have them work with the companies um, because that way they can they can grow more naturally as an industry. Um, and they can figure out what's what works best for them, and uh, in that way develop on their own instead of needing to rely on tax money um, completely. Awesome answer, thank you. Okay. Want to switch 
roles for Rochelle? Yeah, I think, um, I'm, Christine, are we ready to lose our roles? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Um, I, my comments are always very specific, but I thought this was an excellent presentation. I, I really am impressed with how you fielded all the questions, and there were a lot of them. This, they were the most questions out of all the presentations today. Um, <clears throat> Yuki, um, I wanted to give you some time, some feedback on your timeline. Mm -hmm. um, the first time you presented the EU regs, you kind of read through everything. Right. The detail. And then the second time you summarized, and I liked the summary. Um, mm -hmm. The summary better, you know, it, it helped me understand a little more when you summarized. Mm -hmm. And then um, Layton, you mm -hmm. can talk really fast. Okay. <laughs> I also can talk really fast, <laughs> but um, I thought you, you did a, a great job. And um, I, I also like the way you feel the questions. And um, one of the favorite, my favorite things you said was when you talked about standardizing cadence. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, okay, Christine, on to the next person. <laughs> Yeah, there's quite a few people, so I'll, I'll let it go to Brian. I think you're running it, Rochelle, but... I'll yeah, no, no, sorry. I, I That's forgot. okay. <laughs> Brian. Yeah, I mean, just, just as far as general feedback goes, I thought it was an excellent presentation, well-researched. I thought everybody did a great job at um, being knowledgeable about, you know, the topic. It's clear that you guys did a lot of research here. Um, for me, I, because I... You know, my, my personal life, I'm actually very, my company, like, this is what we do. Like, we're in the circular mm -hmm. economy. I, we, like, we, we sell snacks and they're in compressible packaging. Mm -hmm. We're the only company in the U.S. doing it. Uh, and I can tell you without a doubt, the number one problem is that everybody just doesn't have a way to uh, compost. So when we sell our snacks into, like, Ohio, you know, somewhere in, like an, like an urban area in Ohio or something, like they just don't have the same resource, the same mm -hmm. back end waste management kind of uh, collection opportunities that someone in San Francisco or LA or Seattle might. So um, I think that this is, you know, when it comes to circularity and, and trying to implement all this, it's easy to like look at the brands and say, okay, you guys need to do better. We're going to punish you for not doing better. But I think it's really easy to, to miss. Uh, the consumer and, and the back end, you know, the, the waste management piece of it, mm -hmm. um, because it is so important. And as you correctly pointed out, many consumers just aren't even knowledgeable. So I think your idea to, to, to educate consumers is like your, your, you know, first thing you want to do here is super important because I don't even think most consumers understand a lot of these issues and mm -hmm. how they impact uh, the environment, the stakeholders that you laid out. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, one thing that we do as a brand, which might uh, I might offer you to implement here, is we we give the consumer the choice, uh, an option to send back their uh, waste to us. So in our case, if you don't have compost in your area, you can collect your bags and send them back to us, and we'll compost them for you. Which could be a solution for some of these brands um, where they can offer a direct to consumer send back program, and, and it's a great marketing opportunity for them to, as well to say, hey, we take full responsibility for the end of life of our our products, here's a box for you to send your stuff back to us and we'll take care of it. So that's just as an idea, as a creative thing, you might, um, you, you know, it's really not a huge cost to the brand to provide that. Oftentimes, as we find in our company, the consumer will actually pay for that. Like they will pay for the opportunity to, to send it back. So oftentimes there's, no, there's it's only upside for the brand if they can get the consumer to pay for it. Uh, but maybe that's just something that we can provide government subsidies to some of these brands to help them finance as an idea. Um, and then lastly, I just said, uh, I love this stakeholder slide, but I, I do think two things, like, I think there's three main stakeholders involved in, in most circularity life cycles. You, you clearly have the brand and the manufacturer. And I think like oftentimes nowadays, those aren't the same thing. So you might consider like, separating those two things because the brand as we pointed out you know brand could be apple but they're making it uh, with foxconn or whoever that's like out in you know southeast asia somewhere so oftentimes those are separate things and that's why i, I asked you guys to consider 
waste at the manufacturing location because that has nothing to do with Apple. You know what I mean? Like they, they, the manufacturer is is doing something that Apple may or may not be aware of. So that's that's a that's something to consider. Um, you clearly have the consumer who's who's involved in this, and you have the back end uh, waste management facility. So I just suggest that on your stakeholder slide, I think you should definitely call out the waste management or end of life like collection points as like a huge uh, stakeholder in the situation. But I thought it was great. Uh, I think you guys are on your way to to really having a great presentation here, and I really enjoyed it. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Nola. Uh, thanks, Rochelle. Yeah, I would definitely agree that it's a great presentation. I mean, you guys are tackling a really big, <laughs> it's a really big issue, you know, and, and it has so many different components to the issue and really focusing on the company is 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 a great thing. But I think um, reflecting back on what Brian has said, it's the partnerships too that I think has to absolutely be considered in any legislation points, I think, like, whether if it's you guys or just, you know, as we look at the circular economy, it's truly circular. And there's a lot, what I've learned is there's a lot of partnerships and conversations involved. And when, you know, when I mention a more systemic approach, it is considering those various components. Um, and because, you know, at some point, you know, it, they're even Apple and their whole system is a, it, it's, it's a lot of partnerships. So that's, that's just something to definitely consider. I think on a more tactical point in terms of your presentation, love the slides, love the continuity of the brand all throughout. You know, um, I know sometimes tech is a is a thing, but having we saw it with another group, but just having a background that highlights your same brand is also great to unify you as a collective and as a team too, and and in your respective roles and who was responsible for what would have been pleasant to see, but it's totally okay. You guys did great completely agree you know there are a lot of questions some complex ones so good job guys like on all the research and really responding to what we what we had to say um but yeah and i think the last piece for me is just some financial numbers i like seeing numbers maybe it's more of working with mbas but um you know uh, it's always good to just have financials uh, out uh, in addition to statistics on there but otherwise good job guys Thank you. Thanks. Okay. And last but not, no, not last, Liam. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it quick. I see we're run near the time here. Um, yeah, great job. Really tough, uh, I think, topic that you chose for yourself, like really, really big and systemic, as was mentioned before. So a lot of ways to ask difficult questions, which I felt like was definitely done. So nice job. Um, I think going back to Nola's point, I also would have liked to see had a bit more specificity. I know that you have a time limit and so much to cover that it can be tough, but I felt like the legal portion had it and the ethics and the financial portion were maybe missing a couple uh, bits of specificity in numbers or, you know, impact, you know, exactly what will happen to the environment if we don't do this. Some examples there maybe. Um, but overall, yep, great job. Um, really tough topic and you guys did a good job. Okay. Thank you. And now, finally, Christine. <laughs> Thank you. No, I know we're over time, but uh, for the most part, the numbers, you guys did a phenomenal job talking about it. I thought each one of you really knew the topic. So um, good job doing your research and getting that out there. I was I was a little more hopeful towards the end to see what this your solution was going to be for um, having them create products that would last longer. I didn't really see that. And I know it was an idea at the beginning, but and that's <laughs> talk about a big topic, like Nola said, uh, tackling a lot. That's, that's a big one. Hey, cut down on your profit. Um, so that would be a, def a tough one to sell, but maybe we'll get there. And I appreciate you guys very much. Great job. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. And we look forward to hearing your 10 minute and 90 second later tomorrow. Thank all right. You. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.